All right, welcome everyone to On Frequency Century and Century Mini. This is a webinar we're doing specifically focused on our two primary uh, ADSB receivers, Century and Century Mini. Both of them are ADSB receivers and GPS receivers, and Century especially has many other really advanced capabilities that allow you to better utilize a lot of the features in ForeFlight and improve your in flight awareness and safety. So those are the main features that we'll be looking at in this webinar. On the webinar today, we have Cole Crawford. He is a ForeFlight product analyst, and he's a private pilot ASEL and instrument rated. We also have John Zimmerman of Sporties, vice president. He is ATP, AMEL, and ASES. And finally, we have Ryan Braun, who is the COO of UAvionics, and he is a private pilot ASEL and ASES remote pilot SUAS. So as for our agenda today, we'll start with a quick overview of Sentry and Sentry Mini, comparing the two devices and which features each one has. And then we'll dive into some of the selected features from Sentry specifically. And those include its GPS, its ADSB weather and traffic features, its AHARS for pitch and bank, and its carbon monoxide monitor. Next up, we'll take a look at how you can mount Sentry in your aircraft. We'll follow that up with some in-flight tips and best practices with each of our participants just sharing some of their tips and various pieces of advice that they've learned over the years. And finally, we'll wrap it up with live Q&A. So before we begin, just a quick note about the GoToWebinar interface that we are using for this webinar today. You can ask questions via the GoToWebinar message panel on the right. You just click that button that looks like a question mark inside a speech bubble, and it opens up the panel. You can type in your questions at the bottom there, and then we will respond to those questions uh, directly during the webinar. We will also pick a few of the best questions, the, the most informative ones that we think would be most useful to answer live, and we will answer them during the live Q&A at the very end. If you are having any audio problems, uh, you may not be able to hear me saying this, but we highly recommend you join from a computer, not from a mobile device. We often find that joining from an iPad or an iPhone tends to create audio problems, whereas joining from a computer uh, is usually pretty smooth. So if you're having any audio problems, we really recommend you join from a computer. Lastly, this session is being recorded and it'll be available for later viewing at foreflight.com slash on frequency. So with that, I'll hand it over to Cole. Thanks, Sam. Um, well, let's start by talking about what the primary features of our two devices are. So Sentry and Sentry Mini are both compact, powerful devices that deliver real-time weather, traffic, and other information to ForeFlight Mobile on your iPad and iPhone. The core primary features of both devices is their WASP-capable GPS um, for highly precise positioning for a uh, moving map within ForeFlight Mobile, and dual band ADSB traffic and weather so that you can see real time traffic targets on your iPad as well as um, real time or near real time weather information on your iPad like radar. And we'll cover some more about these two features in, uh, in detail here in a minute. If you decide to go up to the Sentry, um, the full size Sentry, you also get some other additional capabilities as well. Namely, um, it has a backup attitude, so an AHAR system in it, which will give you pitch and bank. And then we have a CO monitor in the device, which detects um, carbon monoxide levels in your aircraft. Um, this is especially important if you uh, fly a piston airplane, um, because this, this is a problem sometimes in the general aviation fleet. It also has a barometer in it, so you can see your uh, aircraft's pressure altitude, or if you have an a pressurized airplane, you can see the cabin pressure altitude of the airplane. Uh, the Sentry Mini does not have a battery. It's very small, light, and compact, and you can power it over USB-C from your aircraft ship power or from an external battery pack um, is an option that we see a lot of people use. But the Sentry has a more than 12-hour battery, so you can charge it and put it up in the back of the plane and pretty much Forget about it, it will last for all day of flying. You don't really need to worry too much about that, but it does charge in flight as well. 
Cole, one question we get asked a lot is who should buy the Century versus Century Mini? And obviously either one's a good solution. But one thing we've noticed is that Century Mini is popular a lot with some student pilots uh, in our flight school here at Sporties. So I think five years ago, people thought that, well, maybe an ADS-B receiver is something that you really don't need until you have an instrument rating or you're traveling cross country. And we've really seen that change to where uh, pilots who are just making short trips, uh, VFR-only pilots, as I said, even student pilots recognize that having weather in flight is really important. And so for them, Century Mini, something that's really small and affordable, is a great way to get started. And maybe as they progress in their flying, they can step up to Century. But for anybody who's maybe on the fence about, do I need an ADS-B receiver? I think that's where Century Mini is a great option. Absolutely. Yeah, Century Mini is definitely not as quite quite as much of a financial commitment. And on top of it too, I, I hear from student pilots, you know, having the traffic, especially that first time you do your first solo cross country, having traffic awareness and just that extra layer, you know, you're still looking out for traffic. You're still have your eyes outside the airplane on that first solo, but having the kind of extra peace of mind that there's something else watching out for you um, definitely is a big plus and you'll get that with Century Mini or Century. Let me ask just as a, a follow-up to that there. It's been a long time since I've done my student training. What do CFIs say today with student pilots? Are they eager to have students with traffic on their iPad? Or how do they integrate that into the curriculum? It, I, I've seen it varies a lot by flight instructor in school. What I think the good flight instructors do these days, and certainly what we do at Sporties, is you start the old school way. You know, you start with no iPad and paper charts and everything to learn that. Uh, but then you progress to the way you're probably going to fly for real after you pass the check ride. And so we start introducing things like an iPad with ForeFlight, and we'll do it with the GPS off. So it's basically just a digital map, and you have to learn how to use the tools. And then you can turn on the GPS. And then you can add on uh, traffic or weather. We certainly aren't going to do that in the first 10 hours. Uh, that's going to be towards the end of your training. But I think for flight instructors who really want to train students to go use the certificate after the check ride, it's important to introduce that technology if the student wants to, because uh, the worst thing is to have a student launch off with a new certificate and not really know how to use it, you know, for all the privileges that come with a, a private certificate. So. It definitely depends, but I think I think the good flight instructors these days are are interested and eager to introduce that technology at the right time. I, I sure wish I had it. When I came back from my private pilot check ride, I got uh, stormed out had a had a land twice on the way home. So I wish uh, back in the day I had <laughs> that weather and traffic at my fingertips. Yeah, Ryan, I can say when I did my private two or almost three years ago now. I did kind of what John is describing, where for the first, I'm just going to guess, 15 hours or so, we didn't use it at all. Maybe talked about it in terms of flight planning, and we looked at, you know, we looked at it, but on my first solo cross country, or my first cross country with my instructor, he was using it and making me look at it, you know, to look for traffic and showing me how to correlate. Okay, it's one o'clock, here's, here's where that traffic target is. And then he made me take uh, his iPad with me on my first solo cross country. Cause he wanted to know that I mostly for the traffic, like he wasn't going to let me go on a day where really weather would have made any amount of difference. You know, it was clear in a million, but, um, but for the traffic part, for sure. Yeah, that makes sense. That's great. So first up on deck, we've got, uh, GNSS. It's most often referred to as GPS, and that's probably what you're most familiar with, but really what the receiver has in it is a global navigation satellite system. And we'll talk here in a minute about why it's called GNSS and not specifically just GPS. Um, so GNSS receivers give you a highly accurate position, um, and the most obvious thing that we use this for in fourth flight and why this is valuable to you is it gives you your position on the moving map. So that way you can see in this picture where my aircraft is located and where I am relative to my course line, but it's not just for the moving map. Um, we use it for other features within the app, like traffic alerting. We use it for, um, the cockpit instruments that you see down on the bottom of the screenshot, where it tells you the ET to the destination and the ground speed. There, this is really the build, one of the key building blocks of Four Flight Mobile's having this uh, position source. 
So I want to talk about how a little bit about how this is a little different than having your aircraft's GPS. So the main thing is it gives you redundancy. When you fly with a Sentry, you have additional redundancy above and beyond your aircraft's GPS. If you were to lose ship power for some reason or have an issue with your panel or had some kind of GPS integrity fault with your aircraft's GPS, your Sentry is an independent device and you'll still have that as a source of position for your iPad. And that's why I tell pilots most of the time when they're flying with Sentry that if you are going to choose between your using your aircraft's GPS position for your iPad's moving map or your Sentry, there is an argument to be made to connect to Sentry instead. And that is, if you are an IMC and you you have an issue, you don't have to worry about filling with fitch, uh, uh, switching back to the Sentry for position. You can just leave it on there, and you won't have to worry about it if you have an issue there. Um, other big thing to talk about is many GA aircraft um, in the fleet today don't have an installed GPS navigator necessarily. Maybe it's just a VFR airplane or um, a more legacy aircraft that you're using. And this might be a new addition to um, what you're using. You can't use it for certified um, IFR flight or anything like that. It's just for situational awareness. But um, it does give you that uplift that you, you may want without having to purchase an installed device. Um, I want to talk a little bit more, um, and if we want to go ahead and move on, I want to talk a little more about some cases uh, that we've seen for using GPS from a century. Yeah, so uh, this is Ryan with UAvionics, and when we engineered the GNSS system in the century, uh, we really wanted to do something fairly unique, and that's, that's bring in the best of the commercial GPS world. Uh, what you see in the aviation space, and especially with certified panel mount GPSs, is that they are very slow to be updated. Um, they're designed around having a high degree of integrity. Uh, specifically, they can never be wrong. And they, they always have to deliver the right answer. Uh, but the cost of that is that you're often unable to adopt new standards, new specifications, and new technologies very quickly. Um, as you know from cars and cell phones, GPS has moved quite a ways in the last 10 years, and probably the GPS in your aircraft is uh, 10 years or older, the technology in that. So what we've done with this is we've adopted something called multi-constellation, and that means we use not just GPS, which is why Cole said it's not called just GPS. Uh, it's the generic term for it is GNSS, and uh, we're able to bring in additional satellite constellation. So originally there was just GPS. Uh, GLONASS came out. That's a Russian constellation. Galileo is a European constellation. There have been the addition of uh, what we know as WAS or SBAS satellites, which can also provide position information. All of these things can really uh, help give you a better answer, uh, but they can also provide backup redundancy reliability. Um, so certified receivers are unable to use some of these other constellations. Uh, the specifications either don't exist or they simply have not been created yet. So uh, what we were able to do with this is provide that extra layer of safety and security. And so if there is jamming, whether that be intentional or not intentional, uh, we see a much higher degree of resistance. Uh, there's built-in adaptive anti-jamming uh, on the device that allows it to respond to these type of events and choose the best uh, satellites for any given moment. And, and we've seen this in real life. Um, Cole, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about uh, what's presented on the screen there. Yeah, so this is actually a photograph um, from one of our co-founders here at Four Flight, and he was flying uh, over or near the White Sands missile range. And this is uh, one of his tweets. He said, White Sands was jamming GPS today, causing all the airliners to ask for vectors from ATC. My panel went down too, but four flight was all good with the Sentry, and I still had one meter accuracy and zero problems navigating. So if, if you notice, you look on his, uh, you know, his, his very sophisticated panel there, he has a GPS loss of integrity failure. So his airplane doesn't have GPS position, but if you look on his iPad and he's got uh, his position to within one meter, which is still within the, you know, the WAS tolerance there. Mm -hmm. And it's fascinating to watch that. Uh, in real time, watch a video of something like that happening. And we do a lot of simulations with those type of events here. 
and a lot of we 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 create certified GPSs as well at UAvionics, and so we understand, uh, you know, what situations you want these different types of things. Um, but this is one of those where it's great having that backup. Um, you, you you don't want the wrong answer, but you want an answer, right? You want something that's available, and and having that diversity of receivers here with both a certified in panel and uh, something that is a little bit more resilient uh, to these type of things is great. And as you know, and as every pilot knows, the NOTAMs for GPS interference are not going away. There's been a lot of that domestically uh, and internationally. I know there have been a lot of events recently that have targeted maybe individual constellations. So having that uh, diversity there is a really valuable feature. Yeah, absolutely. One other thing I just want to make sure too that we highlight here is that the GPS within Sentry, because it has this WAS capability or more generically SBAS, that um, augments what we're getting from the the regular satellites and that is giving us a very accurate uh, position solution. So if you look on the iPad here, he's got one meter accuracy and that's in line with what we see pretty much everywhere. So you get a much more accurate and precise position location than if you were just using, say, your iPad's uh, built-in GPS. Because it's it, that's there the GPS in your iPad is not designed the way that the Sentry is because it wasn't made specifically for this use case. Yeah, really. And I, iPad GPS is designed for quick fix. You know, pulling out Google Maps, uh, being able to find your restaurant quickly. The GPS in the Sentry absolutely is designed to be a very accurate device. Using these multiple constellations doesn't just provide redundancy. The more satellites you have, the more, again, diversity uh, you're able to bring to it, the more accurate you can get. And as you mentioned, WASP provides a number of things. That's why uh, you know, you've heard it being so critical for uh, both EDSB applications as well as instrument uh, approach applications. Uh, WASP provides additional integrity information to tell you when satellites have problems. It provides uh, correction information, uh, which does give to you that, that heightened accuracy by uh, correcting for atmospheric disturbances, ionospheric disturbances. Uh, and it also provides additional positioning information, which gets you that more availability. At the end of the day, the more satellites you can see at once, the better, more accurate position that you're going to get, uh, especially as you're maneuvering and you may lose uh, sight of certain satellites in the sky. So it's really, really an important thing. All those factors combined makes for really a world-class GPS in a portable package. Very much agree. Well, I think we've covered this pretty thoroughly. So let's go ahead and uh, move on to the next topic, which is ADSB traffic. So like I mentioned previously, previously in the overview slide, um, one of the core features of both Sentry and Sentry Mini is dual band ADSB traffic and weather. So we'll start with traffic. So you've probably heard me mention this term and you may have seen it, this dual band term. So um, in the United States, there are two frequencies for ADSB transmitters. You have the 1090 megahertz frequency and the 978 megahertz frequency. And that's um, what you may hear referred to as UAT. So uh, the Sentry receiver picks up targets on both of these frequencies, and we'll talk a little bit more in the next few slides about you know how this all works. Um, but to go over just the basics of ADSB traffic, um, you'll see the targets there on the iPad like you're seeing in the screenshot, um, and you can tap for more info. So if you tap the target, that little box comes up that you can see where um, it's going to show you all the information that it's picking up from the transponder of that aircraft. So we can see that it's a 1090 ADSB target. We can see its tail number and its call sign, heading, airspeed, and altitude. And for flight mobile will show you, if you notice, there's a plus 344, which is telling me that that aircraft is 34,400 feet above my current altitude. Uh, some other features that are worth knowing about within for flight when it comes to traffic um, is our high distant traffic feature. Uh, this is a pretty common thing. If you're flying into some very crowded airspace with lots of traffic targets and it's too cluttered on the map for you, you may want to turn this feature on. And what this will do is just hide traffic that's uh, distant away just to declutter the map for you a little bit. Um, to be clear on ADSB traffic, you, you wouldn't want to use this for um, in-air collision avoidance. It's not to replace TCAS if you have that in your airplane. It's it's a situational awareness tool, and you should still be looking outside the aircraft for these 
airplanes, but it just adds that extra layer to you so that maybe you miss that plane in the sky. We all know on a bright sunny day, especially if the aircraft's at the same altitude, it can be very difficult to see them. And this will help you spot them in the sky. Um, so I, I use this personally all the time. Just a couple notes, Cole. Uh, yeah, as you mentioned, this is not a replacement for a TCAS system. There's no resolution advisories issued. Uh, so anything that you know directs both airplanes uh, which direction to go to avoid a collision. But you know, as a situational awareness tool, these have gotten better and better over time. So you mentioned this is dual band. And uh, we have a couple examples. I know some specific situations we'll talk about after this. And when we talk about that, it, it's with uh, the assumption that we do have dual band traffic here. And that means that we can receive directly from airplanes that are broadcasting on either frequency. When the FAA came up with this system, uh, you know, they, they devised a very clever mechanism to try to get you as much traffic as possible. Uh, and that means they try to get you traffic that is on either frequency, and they also try to get you traffic that they can only see on radar, uh, so if maybe a non-ADSB out-equipped aircraft. So uh, they try, right? You might not have that perfect coverage, however, because it relies on a ground component. So you know, we, UAvionics from the start has always delivered dual band receivers. A lot of the early generation receivers were 978 megahertz only. And the reason for that was that weather comes in over 978 megahertz. So if you're going to have one of those things, the value proposition was just having the single frequency. But it meant that a vast majority of the traffic could not come to you directly. It needed to go through a, a, some FAA intervention, go through a ground station. So this dual band feature is really critically important to even increase the capabilities of that situational awareness tool. It's never going to be the TCAS system, uh, but it is really important. And I, I think, you know, if you do have older systems, if you've built systems that are 978 megahertz only, the, the weather is great, the traffic is okay, uh, but putting that all together with the dual band is, is really, really important. Absolutely, Ryan. Absolutely. That's a good point. Well, I think uh, let's go ahead and start covering some of the scenarios with ADSB traffic because there are quite a number. And these uh, depictions of these traffic is being borrowed from iPad Pilot News. So I'll let John cover these. Yeah, thanks, Cole. There's a lot of confusion out there about how ADSB traffic works. Uh, we, we always like to tell pilots that ADSB weather everybody seems to intuitively get. It's like an AM radio. It's broadcasting, and so all you have to do is tune in the frequency and you get the weather. Whereas ADSB traffic is not quite that simple. Uh, it's a complicated subject, so uh, we're going to hit some of the highlights here. But if ADSB weather is AM radio. I like to think about ADSB traffic as a little bit more like a text message that you get data uh, in reply for something you send out. Uh, not a perfect analogy as we'll explore here, but let's run through three quick scenarios. So in this first scenario you see, we're flying with a sentry so we can receive, as Ryan said, both bands of traffic. But we do not have ADSB out in our airplane, so we do not have an ADSB transmitter in the panel or on the wingtip or in the tail. And so in that case, we're also flying in an area with no ADSB ground station. So that could mean we're out west, down low, maybe we're, we're even flying internationally outside the U.S. And so in this case, the only thing we're going to see is other airplanes that are equipped with ADSB out. We're going to be getting that so-called air-to-air transmission. So in this case, we're the Cessna 172 in the middle, and we can see the Baron up there uh, at about one o'clock because he is transmitting his position out in the blind, and we're picking it up. But you'll notice that we don't see that Pilatus back there at about five o'clock, and uh, we don't know that we don't see him. So uh, this is a, just a reminder that when you're flying with ADSB traffic, and especially if you are not equipped with ADSB out, you really need to have your head on a swivel and use the traffic you see on the screen as an additional source, but not a complete source. So as we move on to scenario two, you'll see things get a little bit better here. And in scenario two, we're still flying with I, Sentry. Right, so go ahead. I, I, I'd just inject one thing there on that scenario one. If that's all right, John. Uh, you know, the we're past the ADSB mandate now. So 
in theory, more and more people have equipped. Uh, we know the equipage numbers have have you know turned out pretty pretty favorable, uh, but there's still folks without it. Um, if you are in rural airspace, there's a fair assumption that everybody has ADSB out now. Uh, so rural airspace roughly overlays, uh, you know, with Class Charlie transponder rural airspace that that type of airspace. In this case, we are where there's no ADSB ground station. We're more likely to be remote and more likely to be distant. And that percentage of folks who have not put ADSB out in their airplane uh, probably is going to be more prevalent here. So it's even more of a pressing problem in these areas where maybe you don't have ground coverage that more people have not uh, installed ADSB out and, and therefore they're in, invisible in that scenario. Yeah, a great example where I see this in my flying is at a smaller airport. Uh, you know, you, you're far away from the big city and you're in the pattern. So you're down low, you may be 50 or 100 miles away from an ADSB ground station. So you're dropping out of range of that. You're in Class G airspace, so there's no requirement that you have ADSB out. So it's not uncommon to be in the pattern at a uh, quiet country airport, and you definitely should not assume you have a complete traffic picture in a scenario like that. Right. I think as time goes on, everyone talks about kind of the long tail of these things, it's similar to the the Mode C mandate. Probably more and more will equip. Uh, one nice thing, or not nice thing, depending on how you look at it, is that. Once it's once you're installed, it's not something that people are supposed to be turning on and off. It says that the the law requires you to keep it on. Uh, you you can't just flip it off because you are going to a remote airport. So hopefully that will you know increase the safety of the system. And over time, whether that be you know one year, five years, or fifty years, uh, we'll have more of that participation in some of these remote areas. Uh, and I, I think that will be the case, but especially in these kind of early years of the ADSB mandate, you know, keep that head on a swivel and uh, be aware that everything is not on the display. So moving on to scenario two here, uh, this is a little bit better where we still don't have ADSB out. Maybe we are based at an airport that's you know far outside of Class Bravo and Class Charlie airspace. Uh, but in this case, we are flying and there is an ADSB ground station in range. And more importantly, we are flying relatively close to another aircraft that has ADSB out. So this was maybe the more common scenario four or five years ago before a lot of people had equipped with ADSB out. Uh, but this is still something you'll run across if you have an airplane that does not have ADSB out, but you're flying with Sentry. You'll see not just that ADSB out target, but you'll also see that other Cessna that's at about your 10 or 11 o'clock. And the thing to note there is that that's actually a mode C target. So we are seeing him because that ground station is rebroadcasting his uh, position. So that's a nice feature of ADSB traffic that you're not just seeing other aircraft equipped with ADSB out. You're also seeing mode C targets. However, note that that Pilatus we still don't see because he is outside of the what we call the hockey puck that's around the ADSB out airplane. So uh, we see all the, the the aircraft within that hockey puck around the ADSB out airplane, but we still don't have a complete picture. So it's just another reminder that even if you feel like you're seeing a lot of traffic. Uh, here's another situation where you don't have a complete picture. So use the data you have on the screen for sure to make good decisions and be aware and scan more efficiently. But just remember that there still could be some aircraft uh, that you don't see. In this case, we're kind of on the edge of the hockey puck. And so there could be an aircraft relatively close that is not being transmitted. And, and people may ask, why does that hockey puck even exist? And you know, there's, there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, one is technical. And that's uh, if nobody is listening, why am I uh, using up the, the somewhat limited bandwidth to send the information up? So, you know, the FAA says, well, if there's no airplanes in the sky listening for this information, why should I be repeating it? Basically, why should I let everyone know about everyone that's here? You, you can debate the merits of that argument. And there have been many studies done. Uh, the other is that it, it's part of the carrot and stick approach to ADSB uh, that the FAA adopted, which is. If you equip your airplane with ADSB out, we promise to let you know about all the airplanes that we see around you when capable. So when there's a ground station nearby. So it, it was part of the equipage strategy, uh, but there are real technical reasons to not be, you know, choosing the AM radio approach, if you will, of, of always broadcasting that information out. 
So we'll move on now to scenario three, and this is the best scenario and also probably the most likely these days. Uh, since the ADSB out mandate, uh, the deadline passed over a year ago, more and more, over 100,000, I believe, GA aircraft are now flying with ADSB out. So uh, hopefully you're flying an airplane that has ADSB out, maybe a tail beacon or a sky beacon. And in this case, you are broadcasting out your position, which also means the hockey puck is centered on your airplane. So you should see aircraft within that hockey puck, 30 miles, 7,000 feet. And again, that's not just ADSB out aircraft, that's airplanes with mode C that's getting broadcast up from the ground station. But one thing to point out is you're still seeing that ADSB out target, that Baron up there at about one o'clock. He's outside the hockey puck, but you still will see him because he's transmitting ADSB out. So you're still getting him air to air. Uh, and you will see a lot of this. So uh, earlier, Cole talked about that high distant traffic feature. I think that's very helpful because uh, if you're flying in busy airspace, you can receive ADSB out transmissions air to air from 100 miles away. Um, th that can be helpful for getting the overall sense of traffic, but uh, for most flying, I like to turn that on that high distant traffic feature because uh, the hockey puck shows your, your area where you get rebroadcast traffic, but you'll get ADSB out traffic directly far outside that area. Well, thanks, John, for the summary of all these scenarios. Um, you know, like we said at the beginning, ADSB traffic is a very valuable tool. Um, to being able to have that situational awareness to get a better idea of the traffic picture of an airport you're coming up to, to look at, see if there's people in the pattern or just to keep an eye out on aircraft nearby. I want to talk a little bit more about traffic alerting within for flight mobile, um, which you do need a source of ADSB traffic in order to have traffic alerting. I think that's pretty obvious there. Um, so recently, within one of the recent releases of Four Flight Mobile, we have done a little bit of an upgrade to our traffic alerting algorithm. So this may look a little new to you if you're not familiar with the new uh, way we do traffic alerting, but the enhanced traffic alerting um, is a little more complicated than what it used to be. What we're doing nowadays is we are um, calculating what the time to the closest point of approach is to your airplane. So we have three status levels. We have the regular teal or I guess green color, which is just no threat. We have this yellow warning threat of an aircraft and we have this red color here, which is a high threat aircraft. What this means is that if an aircraft is yellow, it means that um, they will be within two nautical miles and 1200 feet within the next 45 seconds um, based on their current heading and speed and uh, descent rate. If it's a red target, that means they'll be within 1.3 nautical miles and 1,200 feet within the next 25 seconds. In the case of high alert targets, Four Flight Mobile will also give you um, audible alerts. So you can see on the, the screenshot on the right um, that it has a little red box there, and it will audibly call that out to you and say traffic 11 o'clock, two nautical miles, 1,000 feet above. And this helps you spot it very quickly. Uh, one thing to note, though, is that you will not get the audible alerts if your Four Flight mobile app is not in the foreground. So if you want the traffic alerting features to work, you need to have Four Flight mobile in the foreground. And like I said, um, and, and like John mentioned earlier, is not every airplane is equipped with ADSB out. So just because you don't receive a traffic alert does not mean an airplane is not there. Uh, but if you do receive a traffic alert, it definitely means that there is an airplane there. So uh, do not ignore these and make sure you are looking for these traffic. Um, and hopefully you should never see a red uh, alert. Hopefully you um, will see the yellow and plan accordingly to not let it get too close. So I think we can go ahead and move on uh, to the next feature here. Well, actually a little bit further on the subject, I forgot to mention we do have a, one other type of traffic target that you can see from ADSP, and that's ground targets. And these are these um, sort of brownish color targets. And this is a very useful feature, especially um, on a low visibility day. Um, you know, if you're out at the airport taxiing around on a uh, complicated airport or something a little bigger with a lot of different traffic and getting instructions all over the place, especially if it's low vis. 
um, this is a great tool. You'll be able to see the other airplanes around you um, and where they are on the taxiway. So if you get an instruction about letting that American plane pass in front of you, um, you can just look on your iPad as well to help figure out, okay, where is he? Where is he going? Like, what's going on here? Um, so this is a really useful feature, and we especially see this amongst um, our, our, a lot of our airline pilots love this, uh, love this particular ground target feature. And I'd just add one, one additional thing there. Uh, you know, UAvionics is one of the largest producers of ADSB equipment for aircraft, but we also uh, produce ADSB equipment for ground vehicles. Uh, and we, we have a system called uh, VTU-20 uh, that essentially uh, you know, magnetically attaches to the top of snow plows, uh, other service vehicles. And at a lot of airports, you'll see that that they've been so equipped. It's really important for the controllers. I know speaking with some former O'Hare controllers, uh, you know, they, they are very restricted in operations on certain runways if they do not have complete visibility. And that could be weather-induced visibility. Uh, and so equipping those ground vehicles with that uh, makes it visible both to the tower and makes it visible to you and the aircraft. So it really gets you that complete situational awareness picture. Uh, those particular systems are interesting in that, uh, that they're, they're only on and active uh, when you're in a movement area. So they will automatically turn themselves off you know, as, as they uh, pull up to the terminal. And then as you cross that line, the, the systems will automatically activate. Uh, and so you and the aircraft will be able to see them appear on foreflight. And if you click on the uh, on that particular ground target, you can see here that they're they're brown, I believe, coal, meaning that they're uh, in the ground state. So you can broadcast airborne or ground. Uh, but uh, additionally, they have an emitter type and identifier. And so you'll know if something is an aircraft versus a service vehicle or an emergency vehicle. So even emergency vehicles are, are uniquely identified. So really a great feature. Uh, more and more airports are equipping with these systems. You see them very prevalent at, I would say, poor weather airports, you know, O'Hare, St. Louis, places like that. Uh, but they're uh, really getting out there, deployed everywhere internationally. We create international systems as well. Uh, that that have seen really great uptake. Yeah, that's great. One other thing too, I I thought about when I that I use this feature for sometimes on a day, you know, if I'm taxiing out and I notice you know there's a suspiciously large number of aircraft that are taxiing around, and I'm worried about oh how long am I going to be waiting uh, at the end of the runway? Sometimes I'll kind of move the map over to look at the departure end of the runway. Or sorry, the uh, yeah, the beginning of the runway, and see how many. Try to see how many airplanes are lined up on the taxiway waiting to go, just to see, you know, am I competing against, you know, ten airplanes or five airplanes or one? Like, what's going on here? And that um, it it does help. It does help a lot. Well, I think we can go ahead and uh, move on to the next feature that we have today, which is the other side of ADSB, which is weather. Um, this is a very popular feature, and we could talk about this and all the different weather products that the FAA is pumping out over FISB. So first, let me explain what FISB is. Uh, flight, or it stands for Flight Information Service Broadcast. And so this is coming over the 978 megahertz frequency. Those ground stations are transmitting this information to your airplane. Century is picking it up, sending it to Four Flight Mobile, and then we're parsing it and putting it in the app in a way that's... Uh, meaningful for you. Um, so there's a lot of different things that come over this, and I don't believe this is a fully exhaustive list, but this is a um, this is up there in the list. And so the most obvious one and the one that people are probably most familiar with is radar. So you have NextRad radar, and we'll talk more about some of these in specific. There's a lightning layer. You can get turbulence information, cloud tops information. Um, they transmit METARs and TAFs for airports around you. You can get uh, information about TFRs. Pyreps, uh, Airmets, Sigmets, and Winds Aloft. Um, for any of these products that are a map layer, you'll be able to see them on the screenshot on the right. Um, any of the ones that have the little ADSB after them, those are ADSB layers as well as the radi radar composite layer in Four Flight. So um, let's go ahead and cover some of these different traffic, or sorry, these different weather layers more specifically here. So we can show you some different screenshots. So the first kind of most obvious one, like I mentioned, that a lot of people are very familiar with using, and you may use a radar product at home 
um, is like I mentioned radar. So this here is a screenshot of what uh, ADSB radar looks like. So one thing that confuses a lot of people, and I often forget about myself while I'm flying, is that uh, NextRad radar over ADSB. There's kind of two flavors of it. There's local, so anything um, nearby your aircraft will be sent to you at a higher resolution, meaning those pixels that you're seeing of the radar, they're uh, much more dense. And then there's CONUS uh, NextRad radar, which shows you all of the continental United States and what the radar picture looks like, but that is shown on a much uh, less granular level. So you can get just the weather picture around the country, hundreds of miles in front of you. NextRad radar transmits uh, the composite image. So if you're not familiar with this topic, composite radar, what they do is they scan the sky at a bunch of different tilt angles. So at a, you know, at a 10 degree up angle, a 15 degree up, and they keep doing this. And then they take the worst return at each of those angles. And that's what you're seeing on the image. So you're not seeing radar at the ground. You're seeing radar, um, the worst picture at any given altitude at that position. Um, biggest thing that I give advice to people when you're using radar and John, I've heard you guys mention this in a lot of your, uh, your sporties webinars is that you really want to make using ADSB radar strategic and not tactical because there is some delay, right? For them, to, when, once they scan the sky, they have to compile the image and then transmit it. And then by the time that gets transmitted, there's a delay there and then there's a delay in you receiving it. So the image that you're seeing could be, I'd say at best five minutes old, but as maybe as old as uh, 15 minutes or more. So you don't want to use ADSB radar to try to go through a tiny little hole in two cells. You want to use it to make a strategic picture about where is it moving, where is it, and how do I avoid it altogether? Yeah, that's a great point, Cole. And I, I think some people, you can make an error each way here. Some people say, well, it's it's radar. I'll use it to pick my way through, uh, you know, embedded thunderstorms in a line. That's a terrible idea. It's That's not what it's for. That's the only thing you can do with that is, uh, is onboard radar that's really live. However, that doesn't mean that data link radar like you get with uh, FISB is useless. It's, it's incredibly useful, as anybody who's flown with it knows. And one of the things I use it for most is to help me make those big picture decisions in two ways. One is either deviate around it far before you ever get there. So instead of flying right up to a line of weather and trying to pick through it, just swing all the way around it. And if I know there's storms 100 miles ahead of me, I can uh, call ATC or look on my four-flight map and just make a different plan. Totally avoid the system, have a smooth ride. The other thing that's great, even for IFR pilots, is uh, radar helps you confirm what your eyes are seeing. And when I'm flying IFR, uh, you know, you get to go in clouds, obviously, but I'm not going to punch into a cloud that's dark gray and, and burbling up with lots of vertical development. And that's where radar really helps. I can help assess which of those clouds is harmless and I'm going to fly right through and which of those are convective and I need to stay out of. So... I think the, the key is to use radar as one of many tools, including lightning, METARs, some of these other things you're going to talk about, but also your eyes uh, and just what the airplane feels. Use it as one of many tools to make a smart decision instead of just uh, being a slave to radar. That, that's how you fly safely, I think, with data link radar. Absolutely. And one other thing, too, to mention is you'll notice there's a time slider here on this layer on the bottom. And what's happening there is uh, the sentry is picking up these radar images over time and storing them on the iPad um, and on the device as well. And Ryan, you can talk about that in a minute too. There might be some value there. But what's happening is if you want to animate it, it'll take all of the radar images it's received over the last period of time and then animate it across what it knows. And that's a feature, especially John, like, you know, if you're seeing something 100 miles ahead and you're doing the strategic planning, I love using this is animate it and see which way it's moving because you can usually get a good idea that if you want to avoid it, there's usually a, a, a better answer. Usually it's either avoid it to one direction or the other based on which way it's moving. And I think, uh, you know, when we're talking about strategic, we're talking about this replay. Another thing uh, is speaking of the look ahead. So you mentioned there's a local and a CONUS. Uh, when you look at this in four flight, they look pretty much like a single, you know, cohesive view. But What's really happening is individual ground stations are sending out individual products for certain areas. And depending on 
the type of tower, uh, how how strong the signal at broadcast is, they send out different different products and different look aheads. And this has changed a little bit over time, but traditionally the lower power stations may send out 150 nautical miles, I believe, of uh, higher resolution data, what they call the regional NEXRAD. And as you get to the higher power stations, it'll be up to 250 nautical miles. So if you take off from Chicago and you're looking to get the California uh, radar, you'll see something there, but it'll be much lower resolution. So the CONUS, or National NEXRAD imagery, uh, has a 10-kilometer resolution on it. Uh, and that, that contrasts with the 2-kilometer resolution of the, the regional product. So what you're looking at on the screen here, it looks a little bit blocky. If we were you know, 300 nautical miles away, it would be a lot blockier than that. Obviously, this is being done, again, to conserve the... Um, you know what they call the spectral capacity or the bandwidth how much how much uh, data can be transmitted into the air uh, but it does change things a little bit here as we talk about strategic planning look ahead replay things like that uh, on the replay note you you mentioned this the slider uh, Sentry does have some uh, fairly unique capabilities to be able to uh, receive data uh, and then be able to uh, give that back to foreflight essentially as you go in and out of the background. So the, you know, the information is transmitted uh, like an AM radio, like was mentioned for weather. Uh, it's, it's not on request. So your airplane does not go off to the FAA and say, and, and now I would like uh, the regional radar. Uh, instead, what it does is it's constantly looping, just like listening to your, uh, your, your weather broadcast or listening to ATIS, uh, you, you only get it when you're sitting there listening for it. Well, the Sentry, when it's on, is always sitting there listening for it and collecting that information to make it available for replay when you start up. That The intent there is so that when you start your application or leave and come back or you have some type of a problem, uh, you're able to get at that data pretty quickly. And uh, so I do think that's uh, you know pretty pretty important, fe important feature uh, that we, we have there. Um, it, it also cuts down... Uh, on times where you may have just not complete radar. If, if you watch them kind of paint in and fill in uh, on some of the traditional receivers, you don't see that uh, as much here. You'll, you'll get that more complete picture uh, much more quickly uh, over time with, with a product like this. Absolutely. And one thing I want to mention based on what both you, John, and Ryan have mentioned, and this particular screenshot here, um, on using this tool in a practical sense. In this case, this looks kind of scary. You've got some yellow returns there, you know, right at the destination. Is this a good situation? Um, in this case, um, I was visual here and could I could actually see the wall of kind of that cell right there at my destination. And I used the animation tool to see which way it was moving and it was moving away from the airport. And I, I used the, the rule of thumb that John, you know, mentioned there, which is, default there to your eyes, you know, this is to supplement that on top. And what I could see is, you know, I knew this is a few minutes old. It's moving away from my destination and I can visually see where it is and I can see the runway very clearly. And on top of it, you can see uh, what's well, maybe not in this screenshot in particular, but I could see different traffic targets landing at Austin. So um, you can use all this stuff together to get a real sense for what is happening at your destination or, or along your route of flight. Next, I, I want to, on the radar topic, I want to cover one of the more hotly debated, uh, this is like the next track up versus north up thing within four flight. A lot of people have different opinions about this, uh, but this is what we call four color radar. Um, so you can either display your radar, whether it's ADSP or any other source in um, a more granular number of colors to represent the radar returns or the traditional four color radar. Um, so you can see this is the exact same radar image, but they have different spectrums of what the colors are. And it paints a very different picture of the same situation. So um, what I encourage people to do is go look at them both. Like, especially if you're not familiar with the difference between four color, um, I would, when you get up there and you see returns, Try switching them on and off and really kind of get a sense for what they are. And the other thing I recommend with this feature is that you check it out in the Pilot's Guide to Four Flight Mobile online. We have 
detailed information on what the different color codes are for radar and icing and all these different layers. And you can see what the different spectrum of colors are and how they line up. I'll say personally, I choose to fly with the four color radar layer on. I think it's a little more conservative and um, I just have found that that's easier for my mind to consume because there's less detail there. It's just those four colors and it's just, in my opinion, it's easier for me to interpret that very quickly without having to really look super closely at the exact shade of green. One thing to note just in terms of how you enable this feature is uh, you have to have the radar layer turned on and, and this feature works both for ADSB radar as well as uh, internet radar. But once you have that layer enabled, you open the map settings menu there just to the right of the uh, FPL button, the, the gear shaped button. And then the four color radar setting is pretty much at the very bottom of that, uh, that menu. So if you scroll all the way down, there should be a switch that says four color radar. And uh, that's where you can toggle it on and off. Absolutely. Good catch there. Um, John or Ryan, do you guys, uh, have a particular preference on, on flying with one way or the other? The one thing I would add on four color is that this is something that's great to experiment with. It, you know, to me, it's helpful to calibrate what you see on the screen with what you see out the front. To me, four color is sometimes a little bit pessimistic. It, it turns some things red that aren't, um, but that's okay. And it, it's really one of those things that try it on a flight you don't need it. So if you're flying maybe parallel to some weather, turn it on and compare. Because the thing you're really trying to answer with radar is, is that cell convective? You know, you can fly through red all day long if it's stratus clouds and it's just moderate rain. But if it's yellow and it's in a convective system that's exploding at, you know, 10,000 feet a minute up, you're not going to fly through that. So it's not enough just to say red, bad, you know, green, good. You're really trying to understand if it's convective or not. So a little bit of practice playing with this on different flights, as I said, when you don't really need it, uh, is a good way to get to know when does red with four color really mean convective? When does it just mean moderate rain? And, and sort of attune yourself to what those different levels mean. And I'm, I'm sure everyone has played with these things when they're uh, sitting on the ground at home as well. I, I would guess half of the sentry use is probably done just like that uh, because as pilots, we love to see who's flying overhead. Uh, and if you are in within view of a ground station, you can get the ADSB weather. Uh, otherwise, as has been mentioned, you can get the internet weather and that's a great time to look at that as well. Absolutely. Well, let's go ahead and talk about a few other uh, FISB products. Again, we're not going to cover every single FISB product, but you can find more information about all of them online um, in the Four Flights, Four Flight Guide, Four Flight Pilots Guide uh, to Four Flight Mobile. Um, so the next two that we want to talk about are Pyreps and Cloud Tops. So Pyreps, we're all familiar with these. Hopefully, they're pilot reports, um, but we can display these visually on your moving map within Four Flight Mobile um, if you have a source of Pyreps. So these are, like I said, transmitted over FISB. And you can see them on your moving map and uh, see how close they were to you. And you can tap for more info, just like you are able to within the uh, internet PyRep layer if you're at home. Then you have the cloud tops feature. And you can see there's a sort of vertical slider bar there, which will allow you to select what altitude you want to see cloud tops for. And then you can also select the auto button, and that will um, set it to your current altitude. Um, and this is great, especially for those days where you're trying to uh, maybe uh, punch through and get out on top of a cloud layer and get to VFR on top, or um, you know maybe you're just trying to figure out what the situation is like a couple hundred miles in front of you, or uh, just kind of figure out what you want to do in terms of the clouds and whether it might be bumpy or you'll you'll be in VMC or not. And Cole, those two right there, I use all the time together for, uh, as you mentioned, trying to find the tops, particularly in the wintertime with icing. I fly in the Great Lakes area where uh, the, the Great Lakes are really good at making in-flight icing. And in a piston airplane, usually the question is, you know, what are the bases and what are the tops? How thick is the cloud? And so a combination of pyreps, both for icing and 
tops and bases reports. And then the cloud tops forecast tool can really give you more of a 3D feel for the atmosphere and really help you make a smart go, no go decision when it comes to icing. Like you mentioned, it also is great for turbulence, but uh, if you fly in the north in the wintertime, these are some go-to options for staying out of ice. Absolutely. And I actually think my, my go-to most important layer that I spend a lot of time looking at, especially in flight planning, but also in flight, um, if I'm, you know, on a longer cross country is pyreps, you know, seeing what are pilots that are actually at altitude, actually in the conditions saying about it, especially when it comes to turbulence or, or icing to me is the most valuable um, piece of information you can get because that's actually reported at altitude. And one thing to point out there, Cole, is like traffic, you can tap on the pi rep for more information, which is definitely worth doing because, you know, the difference between moderate turbulence to a 747 and a Cessna 150 is quite different. So if you really have questions about what altitude did that happen or what was the airplane, were they climbing, were they descending, tap on a pi rep to get the full details because sometimes that color commentary really can fill in the gaps. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, I find it very cool to submit a pilot report and then wait a few minutes and then you'll see it pop up on your map. It's, I always thought that was really neat. Well, let's go ahead and move on. Um, we've covered a lot of different features within FISB. So I'd like to go ahead and take us into another feature um, that is specific to Sentry in this case. And this is a AHAR system. So this gives you a backup source of attitude. Um, and this powers several different features within ForeFlight Mobile. Um, just want to state here, so the, the screenshot on the right is of Synthetic Vision, which is available in our Pro Plus and above plans. And Synthetic Vision there is showing you, you can see the runway. If, if, if this was taken in a more mountainous area, you'd be able to see the terrain there. But you can see your ground speed and your GPS altitude, as well as your uh, pitch and bank angle, which in this case, it looks like we're uh, coming in for approach to land there. It also can be used um, in your track logs. If you go to look at your track logs and you, and you have a source of attitude, we can show you your pitch and bank um, over time on your track log, which is pretty interesting. I think if you show speed and pitch together, you can see, especially if you're a student pilot, that's really useful to see how those two things correlate to each other. Um, I use the synthetic vision tool myself um, whenever I'm about to go into IMC or um, if I'm, you know, if it's, a, if it's a dark night and it might as well be IMC, I will tend to have it up um, just above my moving map, just like you see in the screenshot on the right. Um, it gives you, even if you're not staring at it because you're, you're staring mostly at your your uh, primary attitude source in your airplane, it's nice for when you want to look down at your moving map for a second to look at something. It gives you something else within your peripheral vision to look at to help keep you oriented. Um, the other big thing is the backup uh, feature is amazing. You know, the vacuum pump failure scenario, you know, the dreaded vacuum pump, um, you know, what are you going to do in event that you're in IMC or, or you're flying at night or whatever it might be? and you lose your vacuum pump and your only source of attitude. Um, you know, if, if you've done your instrument rating, you've done the, the training for, um, you know, for that scenario, but how often do you practice that on a, on a month in month out basis? And having this backup um, so source of vision here is, is invaluable in my opinion. And, you know, UAvionics, we, we manufacture, uh, a number of in-panel devices, including the AV30. Uh, that's designed as a primary attitude source and as a replacement for vacuum systems. And, you know, we've kind of adopted this as a, you know, a company goal here, get rid of all these vacuum systems and aircraft. And the FAA has adopted that same goal as well. The, you know, the studies that they have done place the reliability of those vacuum systems in the hundreds of hours. And these are not <laughs> things that are expected to last 10,000 hours or thousands of hours. Uh, there, there will be failures. Uh, and, and so we think that's very important, both, uh, you know, from a primary standpoint to get, uh, get those rotated out, get the DGs, get the attitude indicators replaced, uh, as well as always having a backup attitude source. So we, we do sell backup attitude as well. Uh, but as we all know, with our iPad on our lap, that is the place 
to really have a, a rich multifunction display. And having that synthetic vision there uh, is just such a wonderful feature. And, you know, all of these AHARS devices are not created equal. I think uh, having been in the industry long enough and worked with AHARS in a lot of different industries, uh, they're, they're tricky to get right. Uh, and, you know, this is a critical one to get right when you're using it to, uh, you know, get yourself out of trouble, basically, whether that be, uh, you know, uh, accidental uh, into IMC or whether that be uh, just night being able to identify uh, landmarks, towers, everything like that. Really, really important. So um, I would I would stress that people uh, on their older aircraft start looking at updating their uh, their their panel to get something that's a little bit more reliable and then continue to have this backup attitude source. Again, another independent thing, especially something that's battery powered here is, is really, really great to have. Yeah. One other thing I too, I wanted to mention specifically on the screenshot we're seeing and synthetic vision is that even if you do have a source of attitude in your airplane that is not powered off a vacuum pump, most uh, of the displays that we see out there um, don't have synthetic vision. And there is a difference between just having a digital attitude source and, or a digital attitude display and synthetic vision. Um, what you're seeing here is you're actually seeing a synthetic version of the horizon and what the terrain might look like all in the background. You can see the obstacles and the runway, which gives you an even greater sense of situational awareness because you can see what your attitude is relative to what's actually out there in the clouds and in the 3D environment. And I love synthetic vision on a display like this because, you know, naturally the iPads are better displays, really, you know, higher resolution, uh, can be more detail, larger databases. So it's really a beautiful product. And, and, you know, just like the GPS that we talked about earlier, this may be a new thing for your airplane. If you're, you know, flying an older aircraft and, um, it's VFR only, you may not have a source of attitude and this could be a, you know, something that you get and put in your airplane and it's uh, a net new uh, capability that you have just in case. So um, definitely a very valuable feature. And uh, I, th I think we've covered this a good bit. I want to talk a little bit about mounting because it does play into um, the AHARs. So uh, when you get a Sentry or a Sentry Mini, you'll get this RAM suction cup mount here, and then there's a quick release uh, locking nut essentially that will uh, mount the device into the um, into the suction cup. And all you do is you turn it uh, clockwise, and that will lock it in place, and it will be on there rock solid. Um, so mounting is important. Um, to an ADS-B and GPS receiver, and it's important to AHAR. So when you first set up the device, um, it will ask you, you know, where are you mounting on the left window or the dash or the right window? Um, then you can calibrate the AHARs. And uh, just so you know, is you can pull this, uh, this menu up, um, or A, it will pop up the first time you use it, but you can also pop it up from the synthetic vision display. There's a gear icon if you're connected to Sentry and you can go through all this. Um, the recommended mounting position is definitely um, on one of the windows. Um, we, we found just from testing that that's where you're going to get the best reception. Um, in most airplanes, it does vary um, from aircraft to aircraft and in your specific situation. But Ryan, I think you might be able to offer some more details on, on that. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, essentially like any radio receiver, uh, the more they're immersed in the atmosphere, if you will. Uh, the, the better they'll perform. So uh, although the dash seems like a wonderful natural place uh, to put it and some of the, you know, early receivers, that was the natural place. As we've been able to shrink the size of these, uh, you're, you're absolutely going to get better reception, uh, you know, by, by putting it on the window. And uh, you mentioned each airplane might be different and you might have some different uh, situations. Uh, but, but we believe that your left or right window will get you the best. Yeah. Um, well, let's go ahead and talk about a feature specific to Sentry that has been very popular uh, since we launched it, and I believe is the first to do this, in, or at least with an ADS-B receiver, is it has a CO monitor in it, so that's carbon monoxide. Um, so anyone, I would imagine if you've gone through your private pilot training, you've probably heard about this. Uh, it may have been a while since you've heard about it. Um, student pilots, you will definitely hear about it, hopefully, in your training. 
Um, so carbon monoxide is a colorless, odorless, and tasteless gas. And what that means is that uh, if you don't have some kind of way to detect it, good luck uh, trying to sense it on your own is, is more or less what that equates to. Um, Carbon monoxide, if you breathe it in high quantities, is definitely going to have a um, effect on your your body and your mental state, um, which is not a great combination while flying. Um, it can have a range of different effects on your body in terms of what the symptoms of carbon monoxide poisoning are. Um, but it's kind of an exponential issue in that the problems and you know uh, awareness issues that it creates makes it harder to realize that you're having carbon monoxide poisoning and it can kind of build on itself. So it's very important that you are able to avoid this situation. So the device, the Sentry device has a carbon monoxide sensor in it, and then it has an audible alarm as well as a status light on the device. So if you have a high level of carbon monoxide, the audible alarm will go off as well as an alarm and a visual alarm within ForeFlight. Um, the audible alarm of Sentry is very, very loud, I will say. I have tested it myself. There is a button within the settings that you can click to test the alarm, um, and it will scare you and your neighbors. So uh, don't do this at 3 in the morning. Make sure you're <laughs> cognizant of when you're setting it off. Um, Things to know about this, we have had a lot of people write in about carbon monoxide poisoning and the CO monitor within Sentry over the years. And um, one of the things that we've seen as a trend is that people uh, see these kinds of issues with their airplanes, especially after having undergone some kind of maintenance. And usually the story goes something like, you know, I just sent my airplane in for annual and, uh, a bolt was missing or they forgot to tighten down the hose clamp or something. And then you have a little bit of a leak and it gets in during the winter and then the sentry goes off because it detects the, the carbon monoxide. And, you know, compared to the, uh, rental aircraft, I typically fly in with the clubs, which often just have the little chemical, uh, color sensor, you know, this one will, will get notice. And, you know, I, I, I often stare at those trying to figure out what's going on with those chemical ones. You know, if you do not choose to get a Sentry, I would certainly recommend, uh, you know, one of the other manufacturers, electronic alarm-based devices. I, I just think it's such a critical problem. And from all the feedback that we've had uh, from the field, from pilots, uh, you know, who have told us their stories, uh, we know how important it is and, and how they probably would have missed it if, it, if they simply had uh, the old school disposable chemical type uh, sitting on their panel. Yeah, it's a, it's a very scary problem in that it's hard to notice. And if you are impaired because of carbon monoxide poisoning, you're not going to be in the mental state to notice anyways. And so it's, it, it's a, it's a very dangerous problem that um, you need to be very cognizant of. And I agree with you there, Ryan, that the, the electronic alarm is really what is important for the carbon monoxide sensor here. And we know we know in houses, of course, it's required now for similar reasons. Um, you know, if if uh, if the aircraft certification rules were uh, redefined tomorrow, they would probably require that. Knowing knowing that the technology is available, uh, they would probably require it, just like smoke detectors and carbon monoxide uh, detectors are required in homes, uh, because it's even more insidious uh, in the aircraft than it is sitting in your garage or um, uh, you know in your house. Absolutely. Well, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, like I mentioned, we have seen a lot of save stories and people write in and I want to talk about one of them. So um, the picture on the left, I'm going to talk about this here in a second, but it's not directly related to this, this story. We looked at a lot of different ones and tried to decide. So I, I'm going to read quickly the story that we he had somebody write in about. This is from a, uh, a an actually a designated pilot examiner sent this to us and said, about 20 minutes into a check ride, the carbon monoxide detector went off and we got an alert on the iPad. It said 75 parts per million and the cardboard CO sensor, which is the chemical sensor that uh, Ryan was alluding to that you sometimes see uh, stickered to the, the uh, panel. Uh, the cardboard sensor stuck to the dash had a little darker ring around the outside, but not really an indication of carbon monoxide. But during a check ride, if you get an indication that something's wrong, what are you teaching if you ignore it and press on? So we landed and were met by the sarcasm and disgust of the CFI and mechanic. They'd look, but only because I was a DPE and had stopped a check ride prematurely. 
Besides, the airplane had just come out of an annual and had a brand new muffler and exhaust. And there you go. You're, you're seeing this is the kind of trend we see is right after some kind of uh, some, some kind of maintenance. So he continues and says, no chance of a leak at all. We took the cowling off. Right there was a brand new muffler and exhaust with a one inch gap in the coupling between the exhaust pipe and the muffler. We were pumping exhaust fumes straight into the cowling and up into the cabin. Um, like I said, this is something, this is classic what we see when we see people write in about this is you have something just after an annual or just after something like that. And just some little detail was missed. And, you know, there we are. And, and actually that's what this image on the left is, is, um, a colleague at work here, um, sent me this and this is their aircraft and they had a sentry, had the device go off, couldn't figure out what it was. And they opened the cowling and, uh, what had happened was that little clamp to hold the hose on there, I guess, was not tightened down quite enough. And just through vibration, this was like, I think, a month after an annual, just through vibration over that time of flying, it eventually just kind of wiggled its way off and suddenly you have a hole. Um, and so that's what caused that there. And like I said, this is, this is uh, unfortunately very common. So I think we go ahead, um, we've covered a lot of different scenarios here and we've covered quite a number of features, but I think we would like to spend a minute just talking about some practical advice from the three of us about um, how to use Sentry and, and really, you know, how to use it in the real world more or less. So the, the advice I wanna give to people, what I try to do is be consistent with it. So um, make sure you are using it the same way every time. I sort of make it part of my checklist. I always, um, before I, uh, you know, as I'm getting the airplane ready and I'm setting everything up, I always just put it up on the back window and I turn it on and then I don't worry about it from there because at that point, I know it's already going. There's no reason to wait till later. And then it's the first thing I do when I open my iPad is I make sure it's connected to the Sentry's network. And then I go on from there and start the airplane. And by doing it that same way every time, you won't find yourself in a position where you've already taken off and you forgot to turn the sentry on or you um, forgot to connect to it or, you know, there's something, you know, that you didn't do. I just try to always fly with the same standard layers and do all that so that it's very consistent and I don't have to um, worry about making some kind of mistake there. The other one, and I think, uh, John, you, you hit on this earlier, but with ADSB weather, spend some time with it, you know, make sure you're, uh, before you go and, you know, really need to use it, make sure you have used it before and you've looked at these different layers and um, when it's not critical to your safety, play around with the different layers and four color versus not and um, how all these works. Um, so that that's my practical advice. John or Ryan, do you guys have other advice you'd like to give here? I think John's probably got more advice than I do, but I, I will just touch on that familiarize yourself. And that's that the reason that I love flying with an iPad and with a Sentry are because it is familiar between aircraft. And as someone who's in a club and who ends up in a lot of different aircraft, uh, it, it's critical to have that consistency. I have a, you know, an Avidine panel in one Garmin, a six pack in another, right? UAvionics in another. It, it brings that consistency. So I, I think it's great to have that familiarity. Um, Two other quick points. Uh, one is the battery life on Sentry is uh, is very long compared to some, uh, and Sentry Mini is uh, even longer because it has no battery. Right, it's as long as your your aircraft or uh, external battery pack has power. Uh, but you know, I try to be in a habit always of of keeping that charged or having a a backup battery with me in case you know we're looking at 12 hours of life here. But that sometimes can make you complacent, so that's part of my checklist. Uh, and then the other thing is that, you know, multiple people can help you with traffic. Multiple people can connect with this. Um, I, you know, I, I know a lot of people we hear from who have the product, the entire family uh, is connected up with their iPhones or their iPads and the aircraft to the single sentry device. Uh, and they're all able to kind of participate in that flight a little bit more. Uh, so I would fully encourage that. We think it's a, it's a great feature and, you know, get everyone involved in aviation. Yeah. And one plug I want to put in there, Ryan, based on that thought is um, if you have passengers in the back and uh, you have them use the passenger app, which I would recommend, it gives them good um, situational awareness and shows them a moving map and it answers the familiar question of when are we going to get there. But um, 
if you have them connect to the Sentry's network from Passenger, then they will also get the benefit of the highly precise WASP GPS position. So it, it, that, that feature of Sentry is compatible with the ForeFlight Passenger app as well. Very cool. The one thing I'd add, guys, when it comes to weather is uh, use all the tools. I mentioned this earlier a little bit when we were talking about strategic versus tactical, but some pilots fall into the trap of just staring at radar or, or maybe the destination METAR. Uh, and we alluded to this with pi reps and cloud tops, but also uh, lightning, um, you know, air mats, sig mats, all, all the tools there. You really want to I always like to say nobody flies free, right? So if I'm going to be receiving all that information, take a look at it because a lot of times a radar image or a METAR won't tell the whole story. You want to have that big picture sense of what you're flying into. And so make sure you know what those extra features are. Uh, make sure you understand what they're saying and turn them on and use them. I think there's a lot to be uh, had from combining, like you said, the example on the screen there, Cole, you know, you, radar, great, but also look at the PI reps, look at the traffic for where other airplanes are going through, animate the radar so you can see where it's moving. Use all those tools together so you really understand. Uh, because I always tell myself, and I always uh, tell this to people I'm flying with, is, you know, the, the person in the left seat to gets to decide. The iPad doesn't get to decide. The radar map doesn't get to decide. It gets to inform us, but it's got to be the person in the left seat who makes that decision. Absolutely, yeah. That's that's a great point. I also want to say, too, I think, John, you've done a, uh, something in the past, I remember, from iPad Pilot News, I want to say, talking about kind of what your pre-flight checklist is with flying with ForeFlight or with, with iPads. And one of the things that I do every time, you know, the night before I go fly is you know make sure all my iPads are charged, packed, make sure the database is up to date and all those things. But just like Ryan said, it's in my checklist is I make sure you know my iPads are plugged in, but also that my Sentry is plugged in um, so that the next morning when I get up to go fly, it should be fully charged and ready to go because there's, there's really no reason um, to take off with less than full battery, right? Um, it's, you, you can't get that back. Yeah, you, know, you can use the, the, um, the airplane to charge the device, but you know, it's important, um, at least in my opinion, to keep, to keep the battery charged before you go, if, if you can. And I throw in one last note here, and, and that's that a lot of the things we've discussed here, uh, have evolved over the last couple of years. So this presentation, if we, if we did it back in 2018 would be different, uh, because, the FAA is constantly putting new weather products into the FISB data stream. So, uh, you know, the, the FAA added lightning, uh, turbulence, icing, cloud tops, air mats, uh, center advisories. All of these things came in fairly recently. So if you haven't used this in a while, you're going to see new things here. And the hope is it continues to evolve and they continue to add value to it. So, you know, it doesn't require any updates uh, to the century. Right, you're able to use the same one that you bought years ago. Uh, and of course, for flight software continues to evolve uh, at, a, at a rapid pace to add these type of features and interpret this data. So, you know, it's great to keep up with it, uh, keep flying and and use these new products as uh, they're made available to us freely. Absolutely agree. Well, um, let's go ahead and talk about one last thing before we get to Q&A, and that is warranty and support information. So when you purchase a Sentry, um, you're backed by not only the four flight pilot support team, but also the UAvionics support team and Sporty support if you purchase from Sporty's in this case. Um, but if you want to just get started and you're not, if you, you, you need help or you're um, struggling with something or you're having any kind of issue and you're not sure where to start, you can always contact team at fourflight.com for help with Sentry, Sentry Mini, or any other um, issues you might be experiencing with four flight mobile. So with that, I uh, think we can go ahead and get into Q&A. All right. So uh, first question up here. My Sentry suction cup does not always hold on the aircraft window. It seems to work better if I moisten the cup before attaching. Any hints or suggestions? Uh, Cole, can you respond to that one? Yeah, I'll cover that one, Sam. Um, so with any kind of suction cup seal, it's important that the seal... Uh, to the aircraft window or whatever you're suctioning it to doesn't get broken. So I typically haven't had any issues, but what I recommend to people and what seems to work is make sure you clean the surface. If you're, if you're having this issue, make sure you clean the surface of the window you're using and clean the suction cup if you can. 
just to make sure that there's no particles or debris in there that is um, causing it to lose its seal. Thanks, yeah. Um, so next up here, how critical is device placement with respect to reception? We got a couple of questions about this uh, regarding whether to place it on the window or on the dash. Uh, Ryan, if, if you're online here, can you uh, respond to that one? Sure thing, yeah, I am online. Uh, yeah, so the placement is not as critical as you might think uh, when it comes to traffic. Uh, the pretty high power transmitters that are in aircraft, and you're generally looking at uh, targets that are going to be pretty close to you. I mean, that's that's your primary area of concern. Uh, so in that situation, um, you, know, you have some flexibility on where you put it. What does become more critical uh, is when you want to receive the data from the ground stations from a long ways away. So the, the more ground stations you're receiving that weather data from, the more complete that weather picture that builds up is, the more frequently you get the updates. And so really giving it that ideal position uh, in, a, in the window, on the side window there, we, we found gives the best signal uh, and gets you both the best traffic and the most best weather. Thanks, Ryan. Um, let's see, so another question here, uh, and it's more of a suggestion really, uh, for flight maybe in conjunction with Sporties should release a training syllabus that incorporates the app right from the beginning. And John, are, are you online to take that question? Yeah, that's a, it's a great idea. Um, we cover it in our Learn to Fly course. Uh, we have some kind of breakout sections on using ForeFlight uh, or, or generically how to use an EFB uh, with training. So it, it is covered in our Learn to Fly course a little bit. The only thing I'd say is it does depend on each person and their flight instructor and kind of their flight school. So it's hard to have a one size fits all answer there. Uh, what's right for uh, you know a rusty pilot coming back in after a break versus a brand new pilot versus a career track, you know, it sort of depends who you are and what your goals are. But uh, I think the better courses out there do cover it. I know ForeFlight has a ton of uh, great videos available online as well. Uh, iPad Pilot News, which Cole mentioned, it's another great free resource. But the best thing is just, I think, to be upfront with your flight instructor about it and, and make it a topic of conversation early on. And, uh, he, you know, he or she is not torturing you if he makes you use a paper sectional and a, and a plotter. Uh, that's okay, but make sure that you know they know what your goals are, and if you really do want to be flying with an iPad, four flight, and Sentry when you have your your rating or your license, make sure they know that so that's a part of your training at the appropriate time. Thanks, John. Next question here: um, Do you recommend removing the mount from the aircraft at the end of each flight or leaving it in place? And uh, whoever wants to take this question, I don't know, Ryan, if if you can answer that or Cole. Yeah, I can cover that for you. Um, so this is kind of, in my opinion, you know, to each his own here. But I personally remove it after each flight um, because, especially if you leave it for days, um, depending on the type of material that the window is made of, it's it's possible that you could have some distortion in your window if you were to leave it on there for three months and uh, you know it was sitting in the hot sun outside not in the hangar right so I personally and I also have other people fly the airplane that I fly so I remove it just so that I don't lose it but my recommendation is to remove it but it's it's up to each pilot I would say yeah I completely agree Cole all right um we got a number of questions, especially uh, when Cole was talking about the ADSB alerts. Uh, we got a number of questions referencing the behavior that we call um, uh, it, when you see a, a ghost. And so this is something that happens where uh, your aircraft will show up twice on your iPad. It'll both show up as your own own ship, um, but also as a traffic target that is of course right on top of you and in some cases for flight might think that that's an actual other aircraft and will alert you to it so what are some ways that pilots can can fix that issue or just prevent it from happening 
Cool. Yeah, so I'll, I'll cover this. Um, so this is what we refer to often as the, the ghost target. You know, you see, you're flying along and you suddenly see this airplane on four flight pop up and it's right on top of you. How did it get there, right? It's a clear bluebird day. Um, so this is not particular to Sentry um, or Sentry Mini. This is just the nature of ADS-B or it can be. And there's pretty much two main reasons why this can happen. Number one thing overall that we see is whether or not you're equipped with an ADS-B out airplane. If you're not equipped with an ADS, the most common thing we see is you're not equipped with an ADS-B out airplane. And so what happens is your mode C target is being picked up um, by a radar station and then rebroadcast over TIS-B to another airplane nearby that is um, ADS-B out equipped. And so what happens is that traffic target gets sent to your ADS-B receiver and then four flight displays it there. Um, without an, if you don't have ADSB out, then ForeFlight doesn't really have a way to detect which ADSB targets are you and which ADSB targets are other airplanes. So that's the that's the first main thing. Um, the other possibility is if you are in an ADSB out equipped aircraft, um, there are some other causes that are pretty rare. Um, but the main one is that um, you could have an issue with your ADSB out transponder. Um, so we recommend getting a public ADSB performance report, and you can do that online um, if you just search public ADSB performance report request. Uh, you will be able to get some issue. Your, it'll help you figure out if there's anything going on with your transponder. We also have more information about um, this online at uh, our support pages on fourflight.com. Yeah, and, and the answer to a lot of these questions can be found if you go to fourflight.com slash support and uh, just try the, the search uh, field there. So, uh, and of course, if, if you don't find the answer to your question there, you can always email us at team at fourflight.com like you can see on the screen. Uh, so moving on to the next question, uh, on hearing audio traffic alerts, how do I configure Sentry or Fourflight audio if I have my headset plugged into the aircraft panel audio? John, can you answer that one? Yeah, this gets a little complicated when you talk about cockpit audio because you have so many sources of audio. So in a typical uh, setup, let's say we have a, a, a Bose A20 or a Lightspeed Zulu, some type of headset that has Bluetooth built in, and it's plugged into the panel with the standard twin plugs. So you're getting obviously the audio from the radio and the from your uh, co-pilot or passenger over the intercom. And that's sort of the typical stuff. But what you want to get that traffic alert audibly is ForeFlight is the one triggering that alert. So the, the traffic information may come from Sentry, but it's being displayed and processed and everything in ForeFlight. So you really need to get the traffic alert from ForeFlight into your ear. And the best way to do that is to pair your iPad via Bluetooth to your headset. So you can put your headset in pairing mode. Most uh, headsets have a Bluetooth button you can hold down to get it in pairing mode. Go to the settings app on your iPad, go to Bluetooth and pair your headset with your iPad. Then you'll get all those audio alerts from ForeFlight. Uh, and it's not just traffic, that, there will also be lots of great stuff about 500 feet and uh, you know runway remaining and things like that. So it's a really good idea. I think there's probably more audio alerts than most pilots realize. Um, it can be complicated if you have like a Bluetooth audio panel and and if you're talking about pairing different devices. So, uh, you know, if you feel like it's confusing, slow down and sort of maybe even almost diagram all the different things you have going in your cockpit. But at a basic level, you want to pair your headset directly to your iPad and that'll get you those audio alerts from ForeFlight. All right, next question. How do I know if I'm near a ground station or receiving a ground station transmission? Uh, Cole, do you want to address uh, what you can do to figure out how your ground station transmission is and how you can even show the location of those stations? Yeah, so um, there's a few ways that you can solve this problem um, or knowing if I am or am not receiving uh, information from ground stations. And the main way is if you're on the maps page, in the top left corner, you'll see a little thing that'll say um, Sentry Good, Sentry Marginal, or Sentry No Towers. Sentry Good means you're receiving two or more, um, you're receiving data from two or more towers. Sentry Marginal means you're only receiving it from one tower. 
and century no data means you're not receiving uh, from any ADSB ground stations. You could still be receiving 1090 traffic. Um, those statuses are also represented on the device itself with the ADSB light, green being good, yellow being marginal, red being no towers. Um, Sam also alluded to the ability to turn on the ability to show towers, and I believe you can access that from going to, by going to more devices, clicking on Sentry, and then there's a toggle that says show ADSB towers. Yeah, that setting might also be available in the map settings menu when you're connected to Sentry. So if you, at the very, anytime you're connected to a device, uh, there's kind of a shortcut to get to that device's settings from the map settings menu, which again is is that gear button, uh, the same one they use to access the four color radar that Cole discussed earlier. All right, another question here. Uh, does the Sentry device automatically calibrate its attitude after mounting, or must it be manually calibrated each time? We got a couple of questions related to this. And also, while I'm on that topic, actually, I'll go ahead and throw out this other question, which is, I fly a tail dragger. I've been hesitant to upgrade to Pro Plus to get synthetic vision because I've heard it's difficult to get a good setup uh, for level flight on the ground. Is that true or false? So. Uh, Ryan, can you take a, a crack at those questions related to uh, sentry calibration? Sure. You know, actually, I think Cole probably has the better answer on this one. If you don't mind. Yeah, I can talk about this. So, um, calibration with AHARs, right? You know, we support the device being mounted in different areas, so we have to know which way is up when you start, right? Like, how is it calibrated and sitting in your cockpit? So. Um, there is a, a menu that you can go to to manually calibrate that, and you, you get there by opening Synthetic Vision and clicking the gear icon, and then you can manually calibrate. Um, then there is also the auto calibration feature, which is available in the same menu, and that basically, um, the device, if you turn that on, it'll run its own calibration routine um, when you're stationary. Um, so I, if you fly a lot of different types, that would be my recommendation is to use the auto calibration feature. Um, myself, I typically fly the same airplane most of the time. And so, um, and I mount it in the same place every time. So once it's calibrated, I don't really have to fiddle with it. Um, so I don't use the auto calibration unless I'm switching types or doing something like that. All right, um, next up, does the carbon monoxide monitor have a lifespan like the chemical monitors? And if so, what is that lifespan? I, I can take that, Sam. So mm -hmm. yeah, the, the CO monitor, uh, the sensor that's used in there does have a lifespan. Those are 10 years. Um, and uh, I don't know, Cole, if, there's, if you have any more information on it. No, no that's all I was going to say is, yeah, they last, they last 10 years. Okay. All right, next up here, and this is kind of a, a somewhat more open-ended question. So uh, I'll start with um, John, if you can give the first answer to this, and then, I, you know, the other two can contribute if you all think you have something to say. But the question was, do you see FISB ever getting closer to live radar? And a number of people did note that the depiction of radar when connected to an ADS-B device is, of course, rather more blocky and pixelated looking, um, especially compared to the kind of radar you get when connected to the internet. So do you foresee that technology um, improving and, and becoming more similar to internet radar in the future? Um. Possibly. There's, there's a couple of parts going on there. One is the speed of the update and one is the resolution of the radar picture. The speed of the update, they've actually done some things somewhat recently. They switched the, the radar source and I'm not going to get the acronym right, so I won't even say it. But um, I don't know that they'll get a whole lot faster, certainly on the regional radar of any faster than about five minutes, uh, just because all the thing that has to happen, you know, the, the next red radar has to scan the sky, usually at multiple different elevations. 
that has to be compiled, quick quality check has to be kind of transmitted and then beamed up uh, from those ADSB ground stations. So, you know, the, the reason quote unquote live radar in an airplane is live is because the antenna dish is right there on the wing or in the nose. And so you're getting uh, the radar report right from the airplane. Just because you know you're looking at a radar image, it could be coming from a, a radar site that's 100 miles away, has to be transmitted up. It's just never going to be real time. So they may do some things, you know, to to knock that down. Maybe five minutes becomes four minutes, but uh, I don't think it'll ever be live. And frankly, I don't think it matters that much. You know, w once you take account of the lag, and once you use it properly, uh, it's really very, very valuable for everything except picking your way through very tightly spaced storms. So um, I don't know that going from five minutes to two minutes would really make a, a huge difference if you're flying mm -hmm. properly. In terms of the, the resolution, I think that's probably a tougher one. Uh, certainly getting that national radar image high resolution would be nice. Uh, as I understand it, that's mostly a bandwidth issue. Uh, the other thing I'll say is that some of the, a lot of the radar products you see in everyday life uh, have been massaged a whole lot. You know, the, the, the raw Nexrad radar image is very much kind of what you're looking at with ADSB radar. And so a lot of that's on, on apps, uh, you know, for flight, I don't want to speak for for flight, but at some point decided they wanted to try to do some things to smooth the radar and make it look fancy. That would be a possibility because a lot of times that's what you're looking at. You know, the, the TV news, uh, showing their fancy radar. A lot of times there's a whole lot of software that goes into that to make that radar picture look a lot more high resolution than it really is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really, really good point, Jen. Uh, and there is bandwidth limitations, certainly. Uh, you know, they've been adding additional products. We talked about that earlier, uh, which is, I would say, filling up the bandwidth. So technically, the way it works is about 20% of that 970 megahertz frequency is reserved for weather products uh, or for FISB products. Uh, so that leaves about 200 kilobits per second total, uh, which is, you know, fair bit. It's more than a dial-up modem, but it's certainly not your your home internet connection. And like you said as well, it's an, it's an AM radio. So it's broadcasting in a loop. So if you look at something like the, the those regional images, the regional radar data, those are transmitted in a loop every two and a half minutes. Uh, and they've been working to optimize the the refresh rates, if you will, into the system, uh, because those previously have been updated every five minutes. It might still be the case, but I know they've been working to shorten some of that cycle and essentially understanding that it could take you know, twice as long. And if you miss data along the way, it could be even worse. So there, there's definitely a limit. We're bandwidth limited in the system. It'll never be live, uh, but there's always optimizations that occur. Great, thanks guys. Um, so we are uh, about 40 minutes over our scheduled time, so I'm just about to wrap it up. But before I do, I want to address this one last question, um, which is, and I saw a number of questions similar to this one, in order to use synthetic vision on four flight, do I need the Sentry? And uh, there's an important distinction to be aware of between synthetic vision and uh, the attitude indicator capability of synthetic vision. So really the only thing you need to use synthetic vision is at least a Pro Plus subscription, that's the, the plan level that includes synthetic vision, and you need uh, a working GPS, and that could be your iPad GPS, because synthetic vision on its own simply depicts you know, all of the terrain and obstacles and runways around you, um, but if you aren't connected to an AHARS device, you just won't see your pitch and bank within synthetic vision, but you will still see your environment and it'll show your altitude and your position correctly. If you want to see your pitch and bank in synthetic vision, then you need to connect to some device with an AHARS capability. Now between Sentry and Sentry Mini, Sentry is the only one that has that AHARS. But of course, there, there are many other devices you can connect to that also have AHARS like the uh, Stratus 2, Stratus 3, the um, uh, many of Garmin's um, installed avionics, um, such as the, what is it, the 345 um, ADS-B out transponder, it, it supports AHARS, and uh, a number of other devices. And you can learn about all of those by going to fourflight.com slash connect. That's where you can find information on all of the supported devices that Fourflight can connect to and the different capabilities that they provide. So definitely check that out if you're looking for 
uh, some alternatives or you know maybe you already have a device installed in your aircraft that can connect to four flight and you don't even realize it so that's a good reason to go to that page and poke around and see what you find so with that i'm going to go ahead and wrap it up thanks so much everyone for attending this webinar you can learn more about Sentry at flywithsentry.com. Um, of course, you can see all of the other videos we've produced at forflight.com slash videos. And the webinars in particular, it's been, we're coming up now on a year since we started doing these webinars and uh, when in-person events suddenly ended. So it has been a very interesting year, but we have thankfully created a lot of really great informative content with these webinars and you can watch replays of every single one of those including this webinar at foreflight.com slash on frequency and finally if you didn't get your question answered or you wanted a more detailed answer than what you got feel free to email team at foreflight.com and our pilot support team will get back to you and we'll make sure you get a good answer to your question so thanks again everyone thank you cole thank you john uh, and thank you ryan for putting on this great presentation, and we'll see you all on the next webinar.